All right. Thanks, everybody, for, uh, for coming to, uh, to my talk today. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about uh, Form Builder, which is a project that's existed for, for quite a little while here. Um, but uh, what I'm going to do today is kind of give you guys a, uh, a three-part introduction into Form Builder, um, an introduction into what Form Builder is, uh, what Form Builder does today, um, ways that you can develop with it, essentially uh, an introduction into the API because this is a, a, a code talk, um, and then also a, a, a short discussion of uh, possibilities for Drupal 8 uh, and using Form Builder as a replacement for our current field UI. So um, the last part mostly theoretical, um, so if the code stuff kind of goes over your head at some point, don't worry, we're going to tone it back down a little bit towards the end. So. Uh, so first off, uh, who am I? Uh, my name is Nathan Haug, or Nate Haug. Uh, I'm Quick Sketch on Drupal.org. Uh, a lot of people know me from a lot of contrib modules that I maintain. I maintain uh, uh, web form, insert, flag, file field, image field, and I wrote a bunch of other ones like link and five star. Um, so, uh, so I'm really active in the Drupal community as well as uh, in the uh, uh, Drupal core issue queues. Uh, my most recent accomplishment uh, was that I put image module into Drupal core, um, including uh, image cache and image field and image API and file field and the field UI. So that was, that was awesome. Um, but actually kind of as a funny side effect is of trying to put image module into core, we really, I mean, we had to shove through the field UI module, which is basically the CCK uh, field UI from, from Drupal 6 put into Drupal 7. And uh, it actually got worse in that process, which is unfortunate. So uh, Drupal 8 hoping to undo some of those uh, repercussions from speeding that along so quickly uh, with, with this form builder talk. Uh, and I'm also the author of, uh, or co-author of uh, the book Using Drupal. Um, also, um, I'm also uh, very uh, active uh, in making a lot of uh, tutorials and instructional videos on, on Drupal. Uh, and this is a pitch for uh, my company, Lullabot, we have a site, Drupalize Me, um, that has a coupon code at the end, and I'd be happy to, uh, I'd love for you guys to try it out and see what you think. So let's talk about Form Builder. Uh, the history of Form Builder. Form Builder is a project uh, on Drupal.org. You can see it's been around since uh, June 22nd, 2006. Um, and the URL, of course, is just uh, Drupal.org project slash Form Builder. Uh, and it originally was a, a Google Summer of Code project, um, this idea of being able to edit a form within Drupal through a visual interface has been around for a really long time and a lot of, a lot of different attempts at it. Uh, in, er, in, in 2008, uh, it was rewritten again uh, in its current in uh, incarnation. Uh, and in 2010, uh, it basically sat there for a long time in, in Drupal 6, uh, basically as a finished product and never actually went anywhere, um, which basically uh, Drupal 7 development kind of came to a close and uh, we found that there was no way it was going to get in, it wasn't ready yet, so it kind of just sat there for a little while. Um, but in, in 2010, uh, Acquia wanted to use Form Builder uh, in their uh, implementation of uh, Web Form in, in uh, Acquia Gardens. So uh, they ported it to Drupal 7 uh, and finished out the web form implementation, which was fantastic. So uh, now in 2011, uh, it's been expanded and stabilized uh, and fully supported in web form. Uh, so you can actually use Form Builder with web form today, uh, largely because of the, the good start that, that Acquia uh, put onto it when they put it into gardens. So uh, the first thing we're going to do is we're actually just going to take a look uh, at what Form Builder is today. Uh, and if you aren't familiar with WebForm, uh, uh, the module for making surveys in Drupal, um, I suggest that you uh, head over to archive.org and just do a search for WebForm. Uh, and there's a talk from DrupalCon Chicago that I did that is an introduction to WebForm. So this isn't really about WebForm. This is about Form Builder today. So I'm going to uh, head on over here to uh, to my Drupal 7 site. Uh, and I'm going to go ahead and create a new piece of content here and create a new web form. So if I add a new web form, and I've already enabled the form builder module uh, and the form builder 
web form integration module. So there's, there's the form builder module itself, which is nothing. It doesn't do anything at all by itself other than uh, provide infrastructure for other modules to implement with it. Uh, and then you need to or turn on a, an integration module, like the, the form builder web form module that comes with the form builder project. Uh, and you can see here, uh, essentially, I start out with a blank form, and I have a palette of fields over here on the right-hand side that is uh, all of the various things that you can do with web form. Uh, and you simply take it and drag fields over from the right-hand side and assemble, um, assemble your form, essentially. And uh, obviously, you can see it's ridiculously fast to actually implement a form like this. Um, one of the reasons for that is because all of these uh, fields have essentially like reasonable defaults sort of defined for all of them. If you were to do the same thing in, in field UI, you're, you're prompted with a, a sea of like eight empty text fields where you're like, what do you want to name your field? What do you want the title of your field to be? What do you want your options of your field to be? What do you want all of these uh, settings to be? And one of the things that is required for uh, Form Builder to work is for, for every single element to have a, a default. So a set of defaults that make sense so that when you drag those things in, things like, you know, the choices here, poor, average, good, excellent, you know, are all there. Uh, but of course, you can go in and edit them. So uh, you edit by uh, clicking on a field, which apparently is being weird. One second. <coughs> so you edit a field by clicking on it. Um, and currently, this is the way it works, where uh, the options for editing a field appear down below. Um, some of the work that Acquia did in Gardens is they wanted the options to show up over here where the palette is. So the API has the ability to display the options for it someplace else. Uh, but the default implementation and the way that is uh, least likely to break the layout of your site is if it just puts it right down below the, the field that's being edited. Um, and then you can go over here, uh, go to your options, and you can add in. So these are the things across the top, poor, average, excellent, or good, excellent. You may add another one that is, uh, you know, awesome, like even better than everything else. And you can see it does an AJAX request every time you do some kind of change of any kind. Like if I want to make this field required, uh, I check the box. It does an AJAX request, and then it updates it, the display of that element on the Drupal side and then replaces it into the interface. So the whole thing is really, uh, it's quite speedy, and there's very little code that is actually needed in order to make this work, because it's all still PHP. This, the actual JavaScript file for this is only like, I don't know, seven, 800 lines, which isn't terrible considering the amount of uh, functionality that, that this does and the um, way that it works so uh, quickly with the Drupal Forms API to actually edit these things. So uh, that's the basic concept here. I, I made the mistake of dragging a field set, which doesn't work so hot. So uh, anyway, you save. Uh, and then I can go over here to view, uh, and you can see that the, the form that I constructed with my awesome option is all, all here and ready, and it's, and it's good to go. Um, incredibly quick uh, and, and really user-friendly. Like the, the concept behind it, you click on it, you edit it, uh, you drag in a new field, all of this stuff, it just goes ridiculously quick. So um, there are some advantages that uh, WebForm has uh, when it comes to implementation because uh, when I was writing Form Builder, I wrote it basically for web form, uh, but with the intention of making it work for other things. So um, lots of abilities that uh, uh, web form is utilizing, but we'll need to make some enhancements in order for this to work with field UI. So let's talk uh, a little bit about uh, the way it works. So. That's basically, you know, the the uh, what what it does. Uh, if you want to, you can go to uh, uh, my site, quicksketch.org, uh, and there's a demos site right up there at the top of the page that is linked there, and you can play around with it as much as you want, or you can of course just download and install the module. Um, so the way it works, um, most people in here, uh, this being the coder track, are probably familiar with the way that Drupal works when it builds forms. Uh, all of Drupal form, Drupal's forms are uh, arranged as arrays, uh, so big nested arrays of things like this. So uh, this would render a, uh, a title field that is a text field that has the label of title, a description, 
uh, a max length property, uh, it would have the asterisk and, and validation for it being required, and it would have a weight of negative 10, meaning it would be at the, like the top of the form, essentially. Um, so what Form Builder does is it basically has the ability to look at any one of these arrays, uh, and then through a series of hooks, you can say, uh, my module knows how to edit uh, fields that are of type text field, so it'll read the type. Uh, and if your module, ha if you've enabled your module to edit this particular uh, type property, like a text field, then it says, okay, well, in a text field, what properties do I know how to edit within a text field element? And then you would specify, you know, title, description, max, max length, required, weight, all of these things here. You would say, my module knows how to edit all of these things. Uh, and in a lot of situations, um, your module may not be able to actually edit all of the available properties here that are available to the forms API, something like, you know, pound process or pound pre-render or pound theme, you know, a lot of properties that are out there that you wouldn't want somebody to be able to edit that from, from the, the, the interface. I mean, you could. Form Builder can change any property, literally any property in the entire system. It can change it if you tell it how. Um, every single one of these properties essentially has a form tied to it saying that, uh, if there is a title property, then uh, this is the form that is available for editing the title property, which is just a text field that lets you type in a new title. So the form lets you modify the value, uh, and then uh, uh, Form Builder basically reads in the properties and lets you edit the ones it knows how, and that it knows of. Um, the craziness uh, of Dribble 7 is that uh, this approach here of using arrays isn't just for forms anymore. Actually, even in Drupal 6, uh, we had this ability um, that the node content uh, uh, property was also an array. So something like the title, this would be the display of the node, was actually an array also. And it would look something like this, where it was pound type equals markup, the uh, title or label of it, maybe it had uh, a title, whether or not you wanted the label to show or not, uh, the actual value of the title, and then the weight. And so uh, this means that uh, with Form Builder being a Form API array editor, uh, and us expanding the Form API uh, concept to everything, everything is now called a renderable instead of a Form API array, um, Form Builder can actually be used on this stuff too. There's no reason why it wouldn't. It's the same thing. It's just that the, the properties are different, essentially. So if you teach Form Builder how to edit these properties in addition to the ones it already knows how to, then you can have Form Builder work not only on your uh, back end for editing your forms, but also on your front end for editing the display of things, which uh, opens up a whole world of potential here. So, so now that we've established that it is a, a renderable array editor, um, how does this uh, module actually work. Um, actually implementing this uh, module into, or inter uh, implementing the Form Builder interface into your module is actually really pretty simple. Um, there's one function that you call to actually like bootstrap the entire Form Builder interface. Um, you can only have one of them on a page, but I hope that most of the time that's not a problem. Uh, you call Form Builder interface, uh, and then just like you have a form ID, uh, you have to specify a form builder ID, uh, which sometimes if you wanted to, you can make that the same as the form ID, uh, and then a type. So a type would be something like, a, if you were editing an entity, the type would be the bundle, uh, which is the node type, or if you were editing a, uh, a web form, the type is actually the, the node ID, so as, since every single web form has a different, um, has a different ID, essentially. So. Uh, what happens when you call form builder interface is that uh, a module needs to implement hook form builder load uh, and it checks the form builder ID and the type and then it loads that form uh, or renderable uh, and then passes it back to form builder. And so the typical thing that you'll do inside of uh, hook form builder load in your module is call Drupal get form and Drupal get form will actually load the renderable array and then you get an array back and then you just return that array uh, uh, back from this hook. And that basically says, here, Form Builder, here's the form, make it editable. Uh, and then the Form Builder interface will be built out and let you edit that array. 
um, or node view, if you were editing like the front end, you call node view, and that gives you the, the content array for a node. And then you pass the content array to form builder, and then it can edit the content. It's really crazy. So, <coughs> um, yeah, you let form builder manipulate the properties it knows about. So this is when the user is dragging in new fields, changing properties, reordering them, etc. cetera. Uh, and then you use a separate form to actually save all of the changes um, by loading uh, form builder from the, from the cache. Uh, very much like Views. Uh, Views has the uh, ability uh, to edit a lot of things all at once. So you can change a bunch of things about like the sort order or the criteria, the filter criteria, or which fields are in it. And all of those changes are being saved dynamically through AJAX requests as you're making them. But the changes aren't actually made to your view until you click the Save button, right? And it's the same thing with Form Builder. Form Builder uses the, the, an identical method, essentially, to uh, store a cache of uh, what's changed as you're making all the changes to your form. Uh, and then all of it isn't actually saved until you click, uh, click the Save button, which will load it from the cache that has been generated by all those AJAX requests. So uh, the hooks that are available in Webform, or sorry, in Form Builder, uh, it's a, a whole set of them. So there is uh, hook form builder types. Uh, and hook form builder types is sort of like the granddaddy uh, of form builder and the way it works. Um, form builder types is basically, um, it's, it's an array of arrays of arrays, you know, kind of standard, standard Drupal practice here. Um, so it's an array of form types, such as web form or entity or node. Um, so that's the key that contains a list of element types that are editable, such as text field, check boxes, uh, let's see, radio, select lists, whatever it is that you want to actually make editable within that type of form. And then it also determines whether or not uh, you have palette grouping and whether or not your fields are unique and which fields are possibly editable. Um, unique fields are, are really interesting and something that right now nothing is actually utilizing, but the functionality is there. Where if you have something like you're editing the node form, um, you want to do something like uh, have the path settings. You know, th there's only one path settings on the node form. You can't have multiple paths. It doesn't make any sense. So if you were to drag in the path settings from the palette, uh, the the path settings option in the palette disappears after there's one already there. And if you remove the path settings from the form, then the path settings reappear in the palette. So you can drag it back in again. Um, so uh, unique fields are really cool um, that uh, are, are useful when there's only one, of one thing possibly. Everything else, when you, uh, when you drag it in, it just you can add as many checkboxes as you want on an individual form. So really cool. Um, hook form builder properties. Uh, and this hook basically defines a global list of properties that can be editable. So things like pound title, uh, pound, uh, pound options, pound, you know, pound everything, pound default values, all of the, all of the, def all of the uh, properties that are within a, a renderable array. Um, there's only one giant global editable list of properties. So um, it's important that modules basically choose unique property names. So if you have pound options, um, pound options is used equally between um, the types of like a radio button or radio buttons and check boxes and select lists. And fortunately, pound options is edited in the exact same way for all three of those things because they're all, they're all the, same, the same thing. They're an array of options essentially. And so... Um, if you're going to be uh, um, making new properties, you want to make sure that your property names are always unique. So like uh, in the example that we saw with web form where I pulled out a grid, I didn't want to use pound options there um, because pound options, uh, I don't want to conflict with the existing uh, settings for, for pound options. So I named it like pound web form grid options or something like that. You can make up your own properties just willy nilly. Um, and make sure that they're unique so you don't hit, run into a namespace clash, essentially. So, so define the renderable properties uh, and forms to edit that property. So each individual property, like pound title or pound options, um, then has a, a, a callback form that is for editing that particular property. 
So if you run into an element that has that property, it just puts in that form that, that corresponds with that property to edit it. Uh, and then there's hook form builder load. Uh, and I already mentioned this hook uh, a little bit earlier. And this is the hook that is responsible for um, essentially finding the form API array to actually edit. So when you call form builder interface and say, let me edit the form by this name, uh, this hook responds to that and says, OK, here's the array that is editable for this particular form ID. Um, so there we go. Um, and then it's complement, uh, hook form builder load. Uh, a lot of other modules, actually very few people probably actually need hook form builder load, but a lot of people need hook form builder load alter. Um, so the module that is responsible for providing the form, like node module, would implement node form mo or node underscore form underscore builder underscore load to load the node form. But then every other module, like path module or um, taxonomy or uh, uh, system module actually maybe, maybe would provide some things to, to edit, or menu module, um, would actually implement the load alter to then add in its modifications to say, oh, that path field set, you can change that too. So path module would provide um, some alterations to make it so you could edit that particular section of the form. If no uh, module claims a particular area of the form, then what Form Builder will naturally do is it, it, it will allow you to move that element up and down. So let's say path module didn't implement path form builder load alter. Uh, what would end up happening is you could move the path options up and down in the node form, but you wouldn't be able to remove it and you wouldn't be able to edit it in any way. Um, and you would just be able to move it up and down in the form. So um, that's sort of a, a natural effect of uh, um, form builders that if it doesn't know how to handle something, then it just lets you move it around up and down and adjust the pound weight property, but nothing else. And you can't nest it either. Um, all, all these things that are, are limitations if, um, if you're working with limited information, essentially. So let's see. I guess before I go on, I'm um, just fire hosing hook names at you guys. You guys have any questions so far? <laughs> it's like, no, no, it is too way over my head. <laughs> so, sorry about that. Um, so, a couple other hooks that are available. Um, there is hook form builder add element alter, and I know that's just a terrible name, <laughs> but that's exactly what it is. And essentially, when you drag a field in from the palette, um, this is a hook that fires just before that element is rendered on the form. So this allows you to do things like uh, um, give it a unique ID, for example. If you're going to be auto-incrementing your IDs of fields that you're pulling in, you can count the number of fields that you currently have and give it a unique ID <coughs> right before it gets added to the form. Uh, and then there's hook form builder preview alter. Uh, and this particular hook is essentially like a, a pre-render function, if you will. Um, it allows you to essentially make some manipulations in the preview um, that make it so that some, some things like a, an invisible element would become visible in the form. So if you dragged in a hidden element or a hidden field into the form, um, even though that's not going to show up when, if it were rendered on the front end, um, it's still really important that the administrator can see that hidden field exists. So you have to alter it to make it be, maybe turn it into a text field or maybe just turn it into... Um, a string of text that says hidden in parentheses or something like that. Something so that the user can actually see that element. So if, you're, if your element is going to look different between when it's actually displayed uh, and when you're working on it in the form preview, then you have to give it, um, then you have to sort of modify it before it's actually uh, shown in the form preview. Um, utility functions that uh, Form Builder provides are actually really cool. There's a, a whole list of them. Um, and these are basically just like tools for manipulating a form API array of any kind. Um, like form builder get element, if you have a, a big form or a big uh, nested renderable uh, and it just has layer upon layer upon layer, um, it's really hard to just find one element in that, I in that entire array. 
And so form builder provides a convenience function for form builder get element that is a recursive search function, if you will, just to pull out that element and then return it back to you. This uh, element ID that you actually are use to find uh, the element, it's not just the key uh, of that form API uh, element, it's uh, in this special property. In that hook form builder load and hook form builder load alter, um, each module needs to go through and basically assign everything that it knows about uh, an element ID. So in web form, that's the, the component ID, and in field module or CCK, that's like field underscore field name, right? Which isn't actually a form API property anywhere. Um, so you need to um, basically tell form builder what that field's unique ID is for the entire form, which every individual field will have a unique ID of some kind. Um, but whatever that ID is, you need to place it into this particular property. So that way, form builder can use this get uh, and its complement set element um, by, by checking this particular ID. So uh, the complement, uh, if you make any modifications to an element, then you can say set this element and it will find it wherever it is in the form API array uh, and insert it back into the array. Um, some other, like a crazy thing that you can do with this is you can actually move an element um, by modifying like pound parents and pound key. You can actually like move an element in the array by getting the element, changing pound key to something else, and then setting it back again. It'll actually move its location in the form. Um, so a whole bunch of crazy uh, logic in there to basically manipulate uh, a form API array through, through code. And then there's this uh, um, really awesome function. The, there's a whole suite of functions that start with form builder cache. And that's that static cache that I was talking about that sits in the database. And as, it, as it's doing AJAX requests, it's updating that cache with various properties. Um, there's form builder cache difference, uh, where you can essentially uh, say, hey, since this form started being edited, uh, what form elements changed in the entire set of elements that change. So if you go in and you only change one thing, like you change a title or a label on something, uh, and then you hit save, only one field is actually changed in that huge array. Um, and it'd be a big pain to go through and like figure out, what are all the elements that changed here, when only one property changed in the entire form API array. And this function essentially does that for you, uh, where it finds all of the elements that have potentially changed. And then you can also tell it to exclude weight. So if you do something like a you drag a field from one position down just one, one slot, that may reweight everything in the entire form. Um, and if you don't want to have that, uh, uh, the weight property essentially to make every element in the entire form flagged as being different, then you can just say, uh, just ignore the changes to weight and show me only changes to other properties essentially. OK, so now that we've got done sort of with the grand tour of hooks that uh, uh, Form Builder provides, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about some, some concrete code here. Um, and that's how to actually save your changes. Um, before I talk about um, saving, this is what it would look like if you were actually implementing this in your own module. Like if you wanted to build a Form Building e interface somewhere on your site. Uh, this would be a menu callback here. So my module admin page, and this would be returning the contents of a page. So the total contents of a page here are pretty simple here. You say uh, output uh, in Drupal 7, all pages, instead of returning a string uh, in menu callbacks, you now return an array. Uh, so the entire page itself is also a renderable array. Um, and you only need to put two, or two parts into this page. Um, you need to load the form builder interface itself. So this is where I was saying, form builder interface, and you say the form ID, or the, hmm, this is a little bit off. It, this should be a, a form ID first here. So, uh, so you basically say load the form, uh, form ID, and then initialize the interface. And then in addition to that, um, that would allow, that, that would load the entire interface for editing a particular form API array that matches to, to form ID. But the user doesn't actually have any way to save their changes. There's no save button that is provided by, uh, by the form builder interface. So you need to make another 
form that is nothing but the save button, which is really kind of interesting. So, so the form builder interface will ultimately call hook form builder load, and then your module would return back the form API array inside of that function, uh, and then you specify the uh, form itself. Uh, when you call Drupal get form, the string that you pass in here maps one to one. The form ID maps one to one to a function name. So here's the form callback for actually returning the form. And as you can see in here, there's nothing in here but a submit button, which is kind of crazy. So the submit button, uh, when you actually click save inside of this button, what this looks like is it would execute uh, the name of your form. So module underscore save underscore form underscore submit. So a submit handler function. Uh, and this is generally what it would look like. So you would use uh, the form builder cache load, and you would load the particular form that had just been edited. And so this gives you the form API array as it is currently, like at the modified one that's been updated. Um, or an alternative to that, that gives you the entire form. If you wanted to, you could use this function, form builder cache difference, and pass in the form ID once again. And that would return just the elements that have changed. So this, this line up here isn't actually necessary. It's just an option. Um, but most of the time, I think this differences um, is actually what's important here. And then you loop through the differences. So you'd say for each of the differences as element ID. So this is the unique element ID again. Uh, you get two uh, properties inside of that uh, array. The original one, so what it was before the changes, and then the modified one after the user had made some changes to that particular element. And then you have to go back through, and this is where you do like the database changes to like insert a record or update a record, save the settings somewhere that record what that property, or like the mappings of, of what changed in that property. So if you change the label, and it's update the field table that stores what the label of the field is, uh, and things like that. So that's the, the general idea of um, the way the, the form builder module actually operates. Um, it's basically a, a whole set of hooks um, that allow form builder to find a form, uh, modules that then say, these are the fields that are actually editable within a form, and these are the properties within those fields that form builder should have the knowledge to actually modify. So there's sort of a, a three-tiered approach there. What forms are possibly editable, what fields within those forms, and what properties within those fields within those forms. So it, it's, it's a, it seems a little bit complicated, but actually uh, implementing it once um, you get over, like form builder provides basically forms for editing every property in all of core. So anything that is in the form API documentation Form API already has, or Form Builder has already provided a form for you to be able to edit that property. If it's provided by Core, Form Builder already supports it. So it makes it so that the amount of uh, reuse of forms is extremely high. So in right now, uh, every time you need to edit a, a title field um, or a title property in any number of form editing systems, you have to write the form all over again. Uh, whereas Form Builder gets an extremely high amount of reuse of the same forms sort of assembled from pieces and then put into a big form to, uh, to control the overall, um, all overall settings for that particular field. So some nice reuse there. Um, do we have any questions so far on the architecture, like the way that, that Form Builder works and the, the way that uh, um, you might be able to use it in your own, in your own solutions? Yeah. Or creating displays or creating emails, may, maybe even in text form? Yeah, so that's a great question. Is there any reason not to use this for front end display instead of forms? Um, maybe even emails uh, or just the display of, uh, of the content on your site? And no, there's no reason why you wouldn't want to do that. I, I actually think that that is going to be the future of this project, is editing front end display things. Uh, and you mentioned emails, which is really interesting. Um, thinking about emails as a renderable array. Um, that's exactly what WebForm does when it sends out emails, uh, is it basically uh, builds up the entire form as if it were going to display the form. But instead of showing the form, it displays a whole bunch of text. Uh, and then that 
text is plain text emails that then get sent out um, whenever, you, whenever a user completes a submission. So absolutely, I mean, th this will eventually be seen, I think, everywhere. Yeah, any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, do I see something like this making it into core? Of course, that's like the big question, right? Um, why don't we talk about that since that's, uh, um, that's the next topic. So uh, what is the potential here uh, for using Form Builder in core? Um, I actually really wanted to show you guys a usable demo because I actually did this. I wrote the CCK integration and node integration and path and menu integration and all of these integrations, but all for Drupal 6. Um, and when Drupal 7 development came to an, an end, um, the Form Builder project kind of stagnated there because I wasn't very motivated to work on something when uh, Core was frozen. Um, now with Drupal 8, um, unfortunately, we're not actually really in a code thaw right now for Drupal 8. It's still kind of like a, a slush or a freeze even um, because of the number of bugs we have. So we don't, we're not really moving forward on new features right now. Um, so anyway, so I just have mock-ups to show you guys. And I hope that's not, not too disappointing. So originally, this was the approach that I was going to use. Um, where exactly like uh, web form, there is a field palette over here on the right hand side. Uh, and what you would do is you would drag in uh, what field module would call the widget. So the widget being like a text field or a select check boxes uh, or radio buttons or something like that. And then it makes that particular element. Um, and then you would click on it. Um, and you would edit the properties and display, you know, exactly, exactly like what we just saw. Uh, but there's a difference here uh, in that CCK or field module both, um, they also have to do with the structure of your database, right? Like what type of data is actually being saved into this select list. Um, and so my original uh, thought was, I was like, oh, well, that's a piece of cake. We just add a new tab here for type. Um, and then we let you choose the widget. Uh, and the data type. So the data type would be text, integer, decimal, whatever uh, type the uh, um, field module would actually use in the database to store that particular property. Um, and of course, these things don't have form API properties. And the only thing Form Builder is capable of editing is things that are properties. So easy enough, you just make up two new properties, like pound field widget for editing the widget. Uh, and pound field type for editing the type. Um, and then you define in Form Builder, this is how you edit the field type property, and this is how you edit the field widget property. And then you allow the user to change those things. So that was the, uh, um, the initial thought here. And of course, um, there are some things that you would need to lock down. Uh, just like uh, in uh, field module right now, after you set the data type, um, text, integer, decimal, var car, whatever you're going to, you're, whatever you're going to set it to, it becomes locked after you set it. So if you messed up the field type originally or the data type originally, you have to delete the field and add it again. Um, but the nice thing about doing this with Form Builder, at least, is that uh, we don't need to lock the data type until after the entire form has been built and the user clicks save. So we have this nice opportunity, essentially, that when the user clicks save. I showed you the submit button that I had where it's literally just uh, nothing but a button. Uh, and then in the save process, it immediately just injects all of that stuff in the database, Analyze, a analyzes the, the changes, saves them. Um, you could very easily build in a multi-step form there instead, though. Uh, when, when the user clicks save, you give them like a review screen of all of the action that's about to occur. Um, and in the case of field module, uh, at least in CCK, when it used to do all the crazy data juggling, when it was like normalizing or denormalizing your database, um, I was suggesting that people put their site offline before they make a whole bunch of crazy database changes. Um, so that, that way you don't get somebody writing to the database at the same time as data is being flown around. So um, all kinds of great things you could do where after the user has set up, uh, set up all of their fields, um, then you can do like a nice like warning screen of these are the things that are about to occur, which would be really cool. So uh, so how does this how does this proposition sound? Yeah, it so, yeah, it sounds sounds pretty cool, right? Um, so this I I thought it made total sense because this is the way I think 
um, that if I want a text field, I drag in a text field, and then I set the data type on that text field. I think that that makes a lot of sense to assemble the form first. Um, however, after having um, a lot of conversations about this, um, I, I was uh, there was a suggestion that I don't do the widgets over here. This is essentially a list of widgets, right? Uh, and then you set the field type or the data type inside of here. Um, that's backwards from the way CCK or field module works right now. And what would it look like if you put the data type over here instead in the palette and you dragged in like text or integer or float or something like that? And it sounds like a terrible idea, right? Uh, at least I think so. So uh, if, we, if we look at this, so text field, file, select, text area, checkboxes, radios. Uh, this instead, maybe you'd get text long text, decimal, integer, float, boolean, list, you know, it's like, well, what's going to happen when I pull in a, a long text, right? You know, what would happen then? Well, I think it would be a natural thing for long text would be a text area, right? And a natural thing for text would be a text field. And if you dragged in something like a decimal or an integer, um, it would probably also be a text field, right? Um, and it's a little bit puzzling, like, what would happen as you were pulling those things in. Um, but uh, if you bear with me here, and we think about this, and it seems like it's not as good an idea as, as the first one. Um, but then I had this um, crazy revelation of you can edit not only the form at this point, because you're just pulling in data types, right? Um, so if you already know the data type, um, the data type essentially is bound to a form element, and then on the front end display, it's bound to a formatter. So why not make it... Um, so you can edit both at the same time. So you could actually toggle between the form here. So what I've done here is I took the, the form preview and I turned it into a tab um, and made it so there's a display option at the same time. And you could toggle back and forth between them uh, and assemble the display part and the form at the same time. And if you drag in a decimal at this point, it would drag in a, a sample decimal number like 1.23456 or something like that. And if you dragged in a long text, it would be a big blob of text. And then you could go back to your form and you could change the form at the same time. And so essentially, this part is like configuring your display formatters. Uh, and this part is configuring your fields. So instead of those being two different pages, uh, it would be one big interface and you could edit both at the same time and save a content type that is completely finished all in one big screen, which sounds kind of crazy. So does that sound like it's a little like feasible? I mean, <laughs> it sounds better. Let's take a vote. Who likes option one? Dragging in form fields first. And who likes option two? Dragging in data types and then displays. Wow. Well, I thought that I was like completely convinced. I'm like, this is totally awesome. It's way better. But uh, so for people not in the room and listening on the, on the recording, that was like an overwhelming majority preferred uh, option one, probably 70 to 30 or so. So, Does what happens if you let the user change the data type afterwards when form uh, exists and uh, there was some already data in the database? Right. What happens when uh, a user changes the data type after um, the form has been built and there's already data in the database? Um, and that's actually one of the limitations of field module right now. You can never change the data type uh, after the field has been added. So as soon as you hit the Save button, which I don't have on this, this screen, as soon as you hit the Save button and those database tables are created, you can never change the type. If you need to change the type, you literally need to delete the field, add another one, and that does exactly what you'd expect of the data. It deletes the data um, and then starts out with a fresh new table, essentially. Yeah. Oh, okay. What about uh, basically a, a mixed approach, uh, Gabor suggests, where on, on the form tab, let's see if I can get there, on the form tab, uh, you drag in the widgets, like option number one, uh, but we still include the display option, and the display option, you would then drag in the data types. I don't know about that. That's what you, that's what you look at. So in display, you look at the type of the data that's coming up, but on the form tab, you look at the widget that's going to be used for input. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, uh, so basically, um, the statement was that uh, 
on the display side, you're actually looking at data. Um, so it makes sense that if you pulled in text, you would see text. And if you pulled in an integer, you would see an integer. And on the form side, if you pull in uh, an integer, who knows what the hell that's going to look like in the form. But if it, if it were a text field, you would get a text field. Um, and that, I guess that has its merits in that if you toggle back and forth, because you could do this really quickly, um, if you toggle back and forth, you'd probably see that all uh, text fields that you drag out all are text, like text text. They're not numbers. Uh, and if you wanted to make it into a number or a, a list, you would be able to make that change rather quickly. Um, back here in the middle. Hmm. So uh, uh, the statement was um, that uh, the data types is not actually, <laughs> that's, that's a really good, good point actually, that what you're doing is you're not actually dragging in data. What you're doing is you're dragging in formatters. So you would say you would drag in a formatter for uh, image or something like that or an image cache preset uh, or something like a um, plain text or trimmed text or a list of all the formatters. And that, the formatters are, of course, only associated with particular data types. So you'd be able to drag in which formatter you wanted immediately uh, without having to change it. And I, I think you're totally right. I think that makes more sense if you're going to be taking the widget approach. The display side should be the formatter. Um, and the formatter then can sort of inherently decide the data type, but only to a certain degree. Because there's a lot of formatters like plain text that apply to multiple types of data, of course. So let's, let's go back here. Okay. So you can use a drop down field to show me only all of them, show me only the integer value widgets, the only the boolean. Gotcha. Yeah, so um, a combination approach um, being suggested where um, in addition to a list of widgets, so we go back to option one, because option one is uh, is winning the battle right now. Uh, option one where you have text field, uh, select checkboxes, text area, and all of these things um, can have multiple data types associated with them. So why not have a list essentially of Text fields, you know, for text field for text, text field for integer, text field for decimal. Could give the advantage of, of, of allowing you to set more specific uh, default values. Yes, and then it would allow you to set better default values uh, when you drag things in. It would also be less clicking. Um, at least I think it would be. It'd be more direct. Um, Form Builder does already have the option of categorizing fields within a palette. Um, by default, it just puts them all in a generic group. Uh, and the generic group, if there's only nothing but the generic group, then it doesn't display a title here that labels them as generic or, or standard or something like that. Um, but if you have multiple groups, such as the unique fields, um, uh, and the node form, I've called them special, so things like path and menu settings and things like that. Um, and there's no reason why we couldn't use that grouping ability to do the data type. So you could have like, a, and then instead of displaying it as just a, a, a long list on, uh, in the, the right-hand sidebar, you might do tabs, tabs of fields. So you want to say a tab that is integers, a tab that is um, uh, text, a tab that is uh, decimal. And then inside of each one of those, you would have a different collection of widgets to drag in. I don't know, just kind of thinking out loud here, or, or UI design on the fly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or, or instead of using tabs, use a drop down that filters or, or switches between uh, available data types. We're going to go up here first and then we'll come back there. Thinking about this in future proofing, uh, um, for HTML5, which would be the better option when you start talking email fields and telephone fields and date pickers? So would it be this one where it's kind of you're picking, say, a date or a telephone or an email, or would it be a text field which is a type telephone? Yeah, so um, the question was, thinking about future-proofing, um, how would we handle things like HTML5 elements that are things like type equals phone and type equals email? 
Um, yeah, those would definitely be, um, they did, hmm, good question. Whether or not the, the data is actually, because um, those fields in the database are still like varcar or text or something like that. Um, but they're a special kind of text, like a specially formatted text. Date, of course, would be a date field or a date time field. So that that's definitely would be listed in uh, both as a widget and as a data type. Yeah. But uh, yeah, you can you can make up your own data types that uh, um, could be something like you would have an email field, um, and that would be both email in data storage and email in in the widget. And there's a lot of modules that do that kind of specialized things, like link module. Actually, I think there is an email module that provides an email CCK field that is specialized. And even though it saves it as text, uh, it provides like additional validation and makes sure that it's an email. Uh, and same sort of thing for, for phones or for um, link module is a really good example of that, where it's still just text that's a URL, um, plus like whether or not you want it to open a new window or not. But it's just like a combined field. So yes to all of that. If you were using email or phone or some kind of dedicated HTML5 element, I would say that should probably both be a specialized data uh, and a specialized widget. So it would be, it would show up in either one of these options as, as a something you would drag in. Uh, in the back. And the form display part, can that be uh, with preview of uh, the one selected as I am selected image? Yeah, so um, <coughs> um, basically, could you choose your own defaults here? So you like your own sample text? Visual, yes. Yeah, your own visual. Um, so you could, in a lot of ways, uh, if you wanted to, you could do it per instance. So if you were editing the particular field, there would be no reason why we couldn't have like sample text here. So you could type in your own sample text or upload your own sample image um, to make it so you could get a better visual of what it was that you're talking about. And that, that sounds awesome. Um, I do think that we would need to provide some kind of default for if you dragged in an image field, it would just be the default, and then you could upload your own if you wanted to. Um, but like image cache or image module in Drupal 7, it just provides that nice picture of the balloons. Um, that's a theme function that you can you can override. So if you wanted to change the f generic one, change it there. Yeah, that's a that's a great suggestion. So and just like over here, we've got default values over here. We could have sample. Display. I think that's a great idea. Is, is my link clickable or not? I can see it. Oh, I made a mistake. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, mean, I think of um, one reason why you might not be able to use the type in the database is things like an address field. They have multiple bits of information. Okay. So, so um, there was a comment about we may not be able to use the data type here um, when we drag in a field because. That's not always just a single field that's being configured, like an address field where you have city, state, or uh, province, I suppose, here, um, country, all of these various fields that are all sort of together. I need to be able to configure those. Um, well, Form Builder doesn't need to be able to edit just one field. As long as there's a parent that wraps around all of those, um, then you can edit the group as a whole, um, which is really cool. Like uh, um, in. Uh, in, in Drupal 7, I suppose, when you drag in like the menu settings for a node, um, the menu settings are actually a group of fields, right? It's a drop-down select list, and it's a text field, and it's, and it's all inside of a field set. And you get to configure all of that. You get to configure if the field set is collapsed or not by default, whether or not it's in a vertical tab, um, which menu you want to be selected as the default, um, all of those things. And you, can, you basically configure it as a group. Um, so if you had a big address field that had a whole bunch of options, you would, you would, it, the list of options would probably be pretty formidable for something like that if you're configuring five fields at once. But you configure them all as a group. So I, I, think, I think that problem can be solved. Um, there was one over here, I think, in the middle. No? Let's go in the back then. Yeah, that's a, an excellent question. Something that almost always comes up when I'm thinking about this, which is uh, um, if you're looking at the display side, <laughs> if you give a user this much, like if you get them this close, 
they're going to want to be able to do everything. They're going to want to be able to do layout, right? They're going to want to be able to do columns. They're want to, they're, they'll they'll be, want to be able to do everything. And unfortunately, what you're doing here is um, you're just configuring an array, right? An array is, by definition, it's linear, right, top to bottom. And so um, the interface that you have here is also linear because it's essentially an array editor. Um, but that doesn't mean that you couldn't do something to sort of fake some layout in here, and I'm not sure that's a good idea. But you could do something like add in as many wrappers as you wanted. Like the forms already have the ability to do field sets. You could drag in a div that is maybe called left column and a div that is right column, and then put stuff into it. Um, and Form Builder would work fine with that. So you basically could drag in structural elements and then nest things inside of there. And how that would actually work, I'm, I don't know. You have some additional things to say? Well, I was just going to say, uh, the minute you're pulling one function to build the whole form, would, would there be potential to say splitting out into different pools? One for um, the form area, one for a palette, and then give you the option to say have two form areas, one palette, and then let the form that's, uh, the module that's defining it pick, you know, which two columns may have at the start? Yeah, so <laughs> could you provide like a set of templates or something like that that, that provide layouts? Um, not at this moment. I mean, I, I think it's it's technically possible, but how you would do that, I'm not sure. So we've only got a couple minutes left here, so I've got one or two more slides that I'd like to, to run through, and then we'll, we'll do the last questions that we can. So um, let's talk about what sort of requirements we have for actually getting this into core, like actually making this uh, uh, into a reality and rather than something that's in contrib. Um, well, there's a couple of really obvious ones, uh, like Stata data object cache storage from CTools, like the way that Views um, has uh, the ability to edit a whole bunch of stuff all at once and then save. And Form Builder does the exact same thing. Right now, Form Builder is just imitating the approach used by Views, uh, when it could be using CTools um, that provides the exact same functionality. And that should go into core. There's no reason why we wouldn't want that. Um, it would also be nice because with multiple modules doing this right now, well, now CTools is the central place, but it would be nice if that was in core. Um, there's also uh, a module called Options Element that I didn't really mention as I was using it, but when I was editing that grid and I s added another option there, um, there's a, a special module that provides nothing but the ability to provide select list options or radio buttons that provides, you know, field, 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 field with little pluses and minuses and drag and drop handles, which is way better than asking users to type a list of options into a text area with a pipe in between them, right? That's just like, it's a little bit, yeah, a little bit kludgy. So uh, options element solves that problem specifically. Um, we need to convert all settings as much as possible like, on the field level, the widget level, and the formatter level into properties, like pound properties, so that when you render something out with a formatter, you're not just checking directly against the field settings, which is what a lot of modules do right now. They just look inside what's the pound field type and what's the pound field name, and then they load the field from the database and then check the settings. What we should be doing is we should be doing that loading earlier on and setting properties on there, so form API, or so form builder is aware of those properties and can actually edit them. Um, every field must have a discrete function for generating a preview. Um, so if you do something like you drag in the menu or the menu options, there needs to be a function that provides exactly the menu options. And right now, things like the menu options are basically hard coded into a hook form alter, and it's impossible to get them out specifically um, without a discrete function. Uh, and lastly, uh, each field must be able to provide a set of defaults including the label, default value, a list of options, et cetera. So this is a good idea anyway. Providing good defaults speeds up the processes in a lot of areas. But this is an absolute necessity if you're going to be dragging in fields. You need to have enough information to actually render that thing immediately, which means setting a good set of defaults. So we actually don't have any time at all for, for more questions. But I feel like we got a lot of them covered, and actually, the small discussion that we had here today actually was worth about three months of issue queue back and forth bantering. So I feel like this is a, a, a really productive session for us. 
Um, but uh, if you can locate this session uh, on the London uh, 2011 website, um, uh, click the Evaluate the Session link. There's also the um, slides are already up on the, on the site. And as promised, if you would like to uh, receive $20 off a first month of Drupalize Me video Drupal tutorials, um, there's a coupon code specifically for, your, for attendees here. Um, thanks very much for coming, guys.